Um, I will go ahead and give a small uh, introduction. And meanwhile, the, the stage is being uh, set up. So you saw a performance of Atusha Faramont. Thank you very much, Atusha. I hope we can uh, uh, applaud you again at the end of the <laughs> program. <laughs> Um, so good evening, welcome everyone. This is the last program uh, uh, of today of celebrating uh, uh, Descent. Uh, my name is Janta Mosselman. I'm a program editor here at uh, the Bali, and I'm uh, uh, really very honored uh, because we have five brilliant speakers for you uh, tonight. Um, the program is called Women Against Gods with a question mark, uh, uh, and we'll explore that uh, question mark uh, some more in this program. Um, and we'll do that with Minneke Schipper, Gitta Sagal, Rana Ahmad, Ibtissam Betty Lachar, and Maike Meijer. Um, and I will introduce them more properly to you later on. Um, so, it is 2019, you will have probably noticed, uh, and women still have not reached equality. In every age, religion, country, and culture, women have been oppressed and undermined for centuries. Um, it has been men who have been shaping religion and who have been putting themselves in the center of it, unfortunately. Um, and we are going to talk about uh, uh, quite a few things. We're going to talk about quite a, a lot of big things, uh, uh, about the practice of oppression uh, and also about the future and if we can change the future. Um, what we'll do is we are first going to listen to a lecture by Minneke Schipper uh, and after that we'll have two panel conversations. Um, and for you it's important to know also that the programs are being live streamed. Um, so if you don't want to appear on our website, uh, I think the best thing you can do is to not ask any question. Um, because there will be room for questions at the end of the program. And if you do want to ask a question, then please kindly wait till I come towards you with the microphone, because uh, then the people who are viewing at home can also hear you uh, ask it. Um, so now I'd like to welcome Mineke Schipper to the stage. Uh, uh, she's a writer and a former university professor, intercultural literary sciences. And both in her research and her essays uh, and her novels, she focuses on the relation of different cultures. Um, Mineke, uh, uh, please join me. You've written many, many books. Um, your latest is called Heuvels van het Paradijs, which is the, the Hills of Paradise. Um, and I can talk about that, but you can talk about that uh, a lot better. So welcome and thank you for being here. Yes, women against gods with a question mark. Or should it be gods against women with a question mark? Possibly. Freedom. Freedom. Freedom is the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. As George Orwell kept reminding us. Now in the global order among believers and non-believers, masculinity has usually been higher appreciated than femininity. And when in the 20th century, women started occupying positions which had brief, uh, previously been um, unaccessible to them, much, um, much happened. And the changes came with uneasiness, awkwardness, frustration, and violence. Sharing privileges does not come naturally in a world where the small one is forced to look up to the bigger one. The weaker one has to bow down for the stronger or mightier one. And is that possibly why most men still seem to prefer a wife smaller and younger and less smart than he is himself? Um, messages echoed all over the world as uh, you can find them reflected in the proverb, never marry a woman with big feet. It was the title of one of my books based on thousands of proverbs uh, worldwide. And the book 
continues to be uh, published uh, in many different languages. These are just a few of them. Now, what can you find in all those messages? The key word is control. Uh, and you can also find it in, in other fields than in Proverbs, in the covering or undressing of women. The rules have mainly been created or imposed by men, and some have been arguing that this was God's will. Now, I decided to explore in my book, Hills of Paradise, so far in Dutch, but it will be in English and in German and in Arabic next year. And um, I explored the few uh, body parts that women do not share with men. And it was... It was quite revealing, all the, the, the comments that I've been finding all over the world and all over the centuries. And uh, the book is called, oh God. <laughs> the book is, <laughs> the book, uh, so I did another book on covered or naked, which was also published in Arabic. And it has recently been uh, forbidden in Saudi Arabia only. So it's still uh, possible to read it in the rest of the Arab world. Now, so Hills of Paradise is the book about these few uh, body parts. And as we will see, uh, these body parts have been extremely impressive. And if we look back, uh, um, no one, by the way, has ever seen God. So most humans have depicted their gods and goddesses with human features. And uh, ancient mythical goddesses uh, gradually have been replaced by male gods. But before even the oldest prayers had been written, there was already lots of images of women in stone or bone or ivory with prominent breasts, bellies, and vulvas. And humanity's first image of life was the mother. Images of birth giving, of breastfeeding, and marked vulvas. They are extremely old. Now, the most ancient uh, dug up so far, my goodness, uh, is the one to the left, uh, the called by archaeologists typically the Venus of Holofels. Well, Venus was just a minor god, huh, and Jupiter was already high up there. So it is a very uh, inappropriate uh, name. So let's say the mother of Holofels uh, is the oldest, about 40,000 years. And uh, the ne next to her is the one of uh, Willendorf. Um, so, there is another one, a, a, a bit younger, but it's extremely important to see that this one from Anatolia, from Chatalhuyuk, uh, about 7,500 years old, uh, she is on the throne and she is resting her hands on two lionesses. And if you look well, in between her feet, there is a fresh-born baby. Um, so what we can then see in, if we take a look at a quote. The earth was like a mother, a, a huge body. Uh, the earth was her body lying stretched out up to the horizon, and all that existed belonged to her. She gave birth and nourished all life without any intervention or contribution from a male god. Plants, trees, and animals came up from her birth channels, and tiny human beings as well. Uh, uh, one quote from a, a story from uh, Mexico, New Mexico. The little people crawled out in the dark like grasshoppers, their bodies uh, nice, naked, and 
soft. So interestingly, I did a project with Chinese colleagues of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing, and they taught me that in Chinese, the key concept God originally meant the ability to bear children. And in the course of history, the idea of bringing forth has completely disappeared from this ancient meaning. And in Chinese myth, like in most other myths, uh, the mother goddess ended up in a submissive role as the partner of a male god, or she disappeared completely. So originally, Mother Earth had all the potential for stepping up to the echelon of supreme goddess. But thanks to a crucial narrative change, this career was blocked by the glass ceiling of her sacred marriage with the male god of heaven. So gradually, she had to make herself smaller. And this is, you see, exactly what in the Proverbs is echoed all over the world. Huh? The woman should be smaller and younger, etc. And this is from a story from India. The earth was too big for the sky to hold in his arms. Though you are my wife, he said, you are greater than I. How can I take you? Make yourself smaller. The earth complied. And thanks to her adaptability, the mountains and valleys came into being. The earth became small, and the sky was able to go into her in love. From their lovemaking, every kind of tree and grass and all living creatures uh, came into being. And you see, this is what women uh, all over the world have often been, mostly been doing. Uh, they made themselves look smaller than men, than their partners, their husbands, who did not give birth or produce life. So the original key to the mystery of life was femininity. Uh, the one who gives life looked more powerful than the one who, do, who did not, and this is still the case. Life giving was disconnected from the independently bearing and nourishing mother. And uh, this is what we see happen in the stories. A male creator gradually takes over all her divine life creating activities and mythical narratives. So what we see is Procreation, creating life as birth giving, was gradually transformed into fabrication, exclusively or mainly uh, male activity. There are extremely many examples. To my amazement, I discovered that over the years. Now look at the following ancient Egyptian tomb text, uh, in which the emphasis is in on I did it all by myself, but not by the, the female, but by the males. Uh, Shu and Tefnut are the, the children he gave birth to, to in fact. So um, I was the great one, Atom, the sun god says, who came into being out of myself, all alone, I fulfilled all my desires. I considered in my heart and planned in my head how I would shape and create myriad forms. So it was I who sped forth Shu and vomited up Tefnut. This happened when I was still alone. I masturbated with my fist. I copulated with my hand. I sped from my mouth, out of myself. He needed no female contribution. So the changing roles of gods and goddesses, of first men and first women in origin myths, coincide with a history gradually justifying equal sexual inequality. Now, think of the book Sapiens by Harari. Probably you have seen it already. He observes that thanks to success of common myth, he rightly says this, 
Growing groups went to cooperate, first in clans and urban communities, later as nations and as world-spanning religions. It cannot be a coincidence, Harari says. Um, that male dominance has developed itself almost universally. But he cannot explain why this hierarchy uh, remains so widely in force. This is what he says. Maybe males of the species Homo sapiens are characterized not by physical strength, aggressiveness, and competitiveness, but rather by superior social skills and a greater tendency to cooperate. We just don't know. Really disappointing, in my opinion. <laughs> because in spite of the pretensions, uh, the pretentious subtitle of his book, A Brief History of Humankind, uh, the author has a blind spot for the revealing light that myth and popular culture throw on the origin of sexual inequality. Two of the key issues in origin and creation myth are the changing roles of goddesses into gods and the superiority of the first man over the first woman in many creation stories, uh, leading into a human order justifying sexual inequality. So powerful myths in which sooner or later a male character became the almighty, uh, the almighty creating people himself, is there something wrong? Or giving birth. Uh, you see, you find in the origin myths a male god giving birth from his armpit or his knee or even from his head. There are so many examples. It is amazing. There is something about birth giving that is really incomparable. Here, for example, this is the, the my almighty Zeus, the Greek god. Uh, he is assisted by the, the goddess of midwifery and birth pains. But from his head, he pops up his daughter, Pallas Athena. And next, here is the Kuba god, Bumba, from the Kasai in Congo. And he throws the whole creation up from his belly. And here he is vomiting human beings. Now let's zoom in uh, onto Adam and Eve, the first ancestral couple in the monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Eve is honored in the Bible with the name, the mother of all the living but her superior status crumbled down. Uh, and there are many, many uh, images of them. I, I'll just show a few. This one I found in, in Istanbul. It starts down on the, on the left with Adam being created and Eve being created independently by God. Uh, and then you know the story of the crooked rib in, uh, in Islam, it's a famous uh, saying that a woman has been is a crook trip, so you cannot stretch her right because then she will break. Now here God is building Eve on a rib from Adam. The, re, the, the rib is somewhat out of, uh, out of shape, but anyway, Adam has no birth pains. He is just sleeping on in paradise. <laughs> but then the story developed and what we see here is God, by the way, uh, always with a, a, bear, a beard. And here he is pulling Eve from Adam's body with his left hand, and he makes a blessing sign with his right hand. So here the birth giving has turned upside down. It's Adam giving birth to Eve. And... Uh, so, and that is a crucial uh, issue of power, you see, because the one who gives birth is more powerful than the one who does not. Uh, and, and what you see in pedagogical texts, uh, uh, this, this is echoed uh, in, uh, in Les Bons Usages, Le Livre des Bons Usages. 
uh, you read this. A good son loves his father, has respect for him, and obeys him because he has given birth to him, even though his mother provided practical aid. So this, this is the new order that is being shaped. And then let's have a look at the, the Islamic book of thousand uh, questions, a sort of catechism uh, in the Islamic uh, uh, tradition. It goes this, was Adam taken from Lady Eve or was Lady Eve taken from Adam? Answer, Lady Eve was taken from Adam. If Adam had been taken from Lady Eve, all men certainly would be obedient to women. So it is clear that Lady Eve was taken from Adam. And another question, was Lady Eve generated from the body of Adam or from something else than Adam's body? Lady Eve was generated from the body of Adam. If Lady Eve had been generated from something outside Adam's body, all women in this world certainly would go around naked <laughs> and not feel ashamed in front of men. <laughs> it's really, f if you just go into it, it is quite amazing. But as long as people believe in their own stories, the established order depicted in the story persists. Have male-centered perspectives on the creation of life were imposed in many creation stories in which originally women's roles in procreation had been central. In hundreds of myths, you see, I found elements trying to put up a sexual hierarchy. Uh, for example, may, uh, usually a male god uh, creates the first man before the first woman. In quite some cases, a male supreme being uh, creates a, a complete male and then a female out of a small body par part of the first man, a toe, a rib, a thumb. Or God says, you create your own wife. Uh, and to make it still more hierarchical. You create her from your own sperm or your own foreskin uh, or your, a, a piece of your, from your thigh. So multiple details contribute to the wished for sexual hierarchy. Now such stories, what do they reveal? Uh, Deep-rooted male awe and fear vis-a-vis -vis female birth giving apparently experienced as an unfair imbalance between the sexes. Well, I can't go into it for, for a long time. I could talk for hours, but let's zoom in on the vulva for a moment. <laughs> Another significant change goes from protecting to threatening vulvas in the stories. You know, genitals and nakedness were one of the most powerful means to ward off evil. Female genitals always intimidated men. Ancient stories told from Ireland to Asia uh, insist on their deterring effect. If women put up their skirts, or up or off, as an effective curse scaring enemies away, and conjuring evil forces. Female figures with vulva exposed were widely used as amulets in ancient times, in Egypt, in Greece, in Rome, uh, in Christian Europe, and various other parts of the world. But weather could be mitigated, storms quelled, lightning averted, Rain brought down and fertility to the land ensured by women bearing their private organs to the sky and the fields or to the sea. Now, you see, this is something very interesting also in the amulets. Here is one from Syria on the left. Uh, <laughs> 
And of course, Renault did very well what it did to protect passengers on the road. So now you know what it is for. If you drive a Renault, you are safer than anybody. But there, are, there is much more. In West England, in the 12th century, in, in the Northern Europe, more often a gaping vulva can be found on gates, on medieval churches, on castles, on city walls. They are called Shilene gigs. And uh, in another part of the world, world, hey, she's no longer there. No, she, there's one that has disappeared. Probably the Bali has censored us <laughs> for once. So you see, strong emotions uh, such as awe in front of the primordial gate and fear of female lust ended up in cutting away the clitoris sanctioned by local traditional narratives. For example, the Dogon in uh, Mali have such a story. So the step from anxiety to aggression is a small one, uh, as countless exhortations to violence against women reflect. I think a whole weekend on violence in the Bali would be very good as well, uh, and very important. So, uh, you see, if you look at the proverbs around the world, they say, uh, beat your wife regularly. If you don't know why, she will know. Uh, and this is about the, the genital cuttings. Now, let's have a, a compare circumcision and excision. Uh, the results are completely, and the consequences are completely different. Uh, expensive male spaces versus restricted female spaces. The removal of the foreskin and the phallic exposure represent male license to venture into the outside world. Whereas excision and infibulation literally enclose women's genitals and lead to practices of confinement and restriction. Uh, and you, the echoes are there in the Proverbs. The home is the wife's world, the world is the man's home. A son who never leaves home always thinks his mother's is the loudest fart. A traveled woman is like a garden trespassed by cattle. So the myths serve to confirm the respective roles of men and women uh, and proverbs to sustain the prevailing morality. Biggest fear, uh, without DNA checks, of course, who is, is the baby in the womb? Mother's baby, father's maybe. And thus there were always advices and rules imposed on women. Uh, and, and interesting metaphors. Two male hippopotamuses cannot live in one pool. There can only be one tiger in each cave. Two male bears don't hibernate in one den. You don't cook two large bones in the same pot. The eye of the needle can, can't hold two threads. So there are widely found, because of this awe and fear, two familiar mechanisms, you will all know them. On the one hand, belittling women in all kinds of ways. Uh, tell, telling them that due to their bleeding and birth giving, they cannot have brains or other talents. And the men warning each other, that's the other mechanism, against the power of women as a destructive something. So, yeah, 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 I'll wind up. So, what has all this done to women? Um, yeah, well, women have tried to please. Let me just go and show you the last picture. Uh, this I found across the Bali uh, in, a, in a bus at the bus stop. And uh, this is uh, the, a dessert attractive in Japan. This is an advertising for men's costumes. Uh, so this is the 
terror of the outside, and you find it on the other side of the coin in completely uh, covering women. You see, uh, this is uh, from uh, Bushra al Mutawake uh, uh, from Yemen. Now, there is one small good news. I'm rounding off, uh, don't worry. The good news is that the strict boundaries between the sexes uh, are changing, and the transition areas between the two become more and more crowded. Um, instead of fixing, fixation on phallus monologues or vagina monologues, uh, we can explore dialogues across all boundaries. And let me talk one last moment about uh, how to promote tolerance. I started with George Orwell's freedom is the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. Today, however, there are also those claiming their own freedoms in order to limit other people's freedoms by imposing their rights not to be offended. The right not to be offended allows risk to give society, society less freedom instead of more. Well, in a decent society, ideally, believers and non-believers join hands in defending within the limits of the law, not only their own rights and freedoms, but also those of dissenters with whom they completely disagree. So let me end uh, with my favorite proverb from Tibet. A hundred male and a hundred female qualities make a perfect human being. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, so we'll have two more panels, uh, um, and I won't send you out uh, too late. But um, uh, yeah, let's just uh, go ahead. Can I please have Ibtissam Betty Lashar, a clinical psychologist specialized in violence against women and sexual violence. She is the leader of Mali, uh, and coincidentally, it was yesterday that her organization was 10 years old. So it's a really... Uh, <laughs> And if I say it correctly, it's Movement Alternative for Liberté Individuelle. Yeah, in English, Alternative Movement for Individual Individuals. Liberties. We'll talk about that more. And can I also have Rana Ahmad uh, with us? She's an activist, women rights campaigner. Uh, she hopes to help all girls to be free. Um, and after she became an atheist, she escaped Saudi Arabia uh, because she was threatened by death and with her family and by her family and the government. Uh, and she's written a, a, a book. Uh, and we will talk about that a bit more as well. Thank you, Rana. Please join me. Welcome both. Very, very happy to have you here. Um, Rana, I want to start with you because you lived in Saudi Arabia until you fled. Um, and can you take us back to the exact moment when you knew you wanted to leave? Uh, when my mom forced me to go to Mecca, this, it was uh, 2014. Um, it's really horrible to be an atheist and going to Mecca, the most holy place for all the Muslims, around you, two or three million Muslims. And I get the idea to make a photo, Atheist Republic. Thank you, Armin, to publish this photo. <laughs> um, and this year, I decide Next year, if I don't run away, I want to kill myself because you can't live two lives in the same time. From inside, I am atheist, and from outside, I have to be a Muslim woman all the time. I am lying for my family, lying for society, and having pain inside me. What was the, you're saying, I was living two lives, and it's very conflicting. What was the thing you find it most hard in everyday life? I don't have my rights, I don't have freedom. I have, I have to behave like a Muslim girl. I have to cover myself. I have to be another person. And it's, for a long time, it's, it's really a, a lot of pain. 
Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at your life from now, it would be one f if you would name one thing that is the biggest difference that makes you the happiest, what would it be? Walking in the street. Yeah? Tell me. I think no one can imagine like walking in the street like a normal act. Everyone do it here in Europe, but it would be like a big dream for the girl coming from this country or a Muslim country. And it was my dream. It was my dream to walk in the street without covering myself, uh, enjoying the weather, the sun, the everything. Uh, and I am happy to do it every day. Even until now, I am like f uh, four years outside from Saudi Arabia. Sometimes when I close my, the door in my uh, apartment, I'm getting out, I think, I say for myself, I am proud about you, Rana, because you ran away and you skipped and you deserve this freedom. Thank you. So, uh, all women in Saudi Arabia, when they go out, they have to have the male guardian with them, right? Um, can you tell me what that was like? Because I think it's really hard to imagine. And not only the guardian, you need the permission in the first step from your mom or from your dad, and then you need someone to pick you up, and then you need uh, to say where you are going and why, you're, why you are going there. Even with my girlfriends or uh, a lot of groups for friends, I am not allowed to go there or enjoying any party or doing anything in my life. Um, yeah, and I was dreaming when I get out, I have my life and I will be happy, but I don't have, I don't have any idea that even when I come to Europa, I have to fight again for the right and for other women. Why? <laughs> a little politic, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I have the idea about Germany and about all Europe country that they are really a secular land and we are safe there. But when I come here, um, the first day when I was in the camp with the other Muslim refugee, I said, what's going on? I skipped uh, six, thousand kilometer, I leave everything to be free and have my rights, and I found myself here. I was suffering there until I contact Mariam Namazi. Thank you for your help. I remember that until now. And thank you for Mina Ahadi in Germany. Thank you, Mina. Um, uh, I feel like I have to do something for the atheist refugee again in Germany. And I have the organization now, Atheist Refugee Relief, Sekulara Fischlinghilfe in German. And I am helping the other atheists because when I come to Germany, I found, I found a Christian organization, a Muslim organization, but like atheists, you are completely alone and no one cares about you. Do you remember what, what, what they said to you when you first arrived? What was oppressing? I asked uh, the so social work about uh, atheist organization and he was laughing. Why? Why we need a atheist uh, organization? He was completely shocked. I told him, if anyone needs help from atheists, did, uh, did, did there, there is anyone to help or something like this? That was before I contacted Mina, uh, uh, Mariam Namazi. Yeah, I was completely shocked and I promised myself in the future when I have the opportunity, I will make organization to help other uh, atheist refugee. And I did it and I have it now and I work a lot it's like a lot of my time in this organization um, and I hope it will be international in the future. Thank you. Betty, it's been 10 years and um, uh, you started with organizing these picnics yeah. during the Ramadan. During the day, yeah. Ramadan. Yes. Yeah, it was um, in September 2009. 2009. And uh, maybe I'm really naive, but there's one thing I really don't understand about it because you know, if you were to fast and I was to eat, then why would you want me to fast as well? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, complicated. So first of all, I want to thank the Bali for the invitation and to thank Mariam Namazi. Thank you very much for the invitation and for your support. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, 
I co-founded this movement uh, to fight for individual liberties, and I think the pillar of individual liberties is um, freedom of conscience and laicity, <laughs> not secularism. Uh, so to separate um, religion for state and politics. So that's why our first, um, we co-founded the movement during Ramadan, so it's a coincidence. So the first um, uh, action or happening was uh, this picnic during the day of Ramadan, because people um, has to know that there is in the Moroccan penal code, in Mor Moroccan penal code, an article. Uh, it's forbidden to uh, eat or smoke during Ramadan when you are known as Muslim. So we don't understand really what known as Muslim means, but because we don't have freedom of conscience, so we are uh, we born Muslim and we dead as Muslim. So uh, there is this article, uh, first of all, and there is like the mentality. It's a very conservative um, um, society, very re religious society, and there is um, uh, religious Islamic education in the uh, education system at school and high school. So there's a lot of things that uh, religion and Islam is very important in the country. But in, the, in the Islam, uh, we have like, um, there's like five um, pillars. But in Morocco, specifically Ramadan is the most um, important one. So it's weird because there's like five pillars and uh, we don't understand why in Morocco Ramadan is the most important. Like people can not go to the mosque or not, not uh, pray and it's not the same problem. So because of that, uh, Ramadan is very symbolic of Islam and uh, because you are a Muslim or known as Muslim, you have to fast. So it's because like me, as Ibtissam, as Moroccan woman and Muslim woman, I have to fast. If you go to Morocco, you don't have this problem with people or with the law. So I could do that. If I would, yeah, you yeah. can have some problems because there's mm -hmm. like crazy people or whatever, yes. but it's not mm -hmm. the same. It's, it's specifically because you are Muslim and you have to practice and you cannot be atheist or apostate or change your religion. But then, um, uh, uh, I wonder, is it like, because in the Netherlands we have a, a proverb and it says, um, you must your hoofd niet boven het maaiveld uitsteken, which means that you should not put your head above the cornfield. Is it like that? Do you think? In Morocco, yes, but it's not uh, only uh, about um, freedom of conscience, it's about all individual liberties and the women's rights, etc. So it's about a lot of things. You have to be quiet, you have to be uh, like normal, mm -hmm. yeah, conformist. So yes. it's very difficult. And I think because I'm a woman, it's very difficult uh, to me and a lot of women in, in Morocco. It's very different how society and uh, public opinion um, uh, treat like uh, with women and men. It's not the same uh, behaviors and attitude. So if Mali was founded by two men, what would have been the difference in approach by people? Excuse me? If, the, if, if Mali, if it would yeah. have been founded by two men? <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, Mali was co-founded. Uh, uh, yeah, we was two women. It was like uh, with, um, with Zina Bel Razwi, actually, uh, 10 years ago. And uh, it, the, the question is very funny because we had a lot of problem with the, the authorities. We get arrested and a lot of uh, um, international media talk about this uh, picnic. And, but the authorities say that the, the problem, yeah, it's the problem, like the picnic is the problem and our fight. But a lot of uh, policemen say to us that there is another problem. It's because we are two women. So we don't have to fight for our rights, we don't have to speak out, and until now, uh, activist women, and uh, especially women uh, from Mali movement, we have lots of problems because we are women. So it's very, um, yeah, because it's a conservative society and very misogynist society, so it's very complicated and different. It's interesting. I, 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 um, I was wondering because we talk, I think, a lot about inequality, but without saying what it is exactly. So I wanted to ask you, if you could, uh, uh, you know, if you could change a law tomorrow, can you give an example? What, what would, for both of you, 
What would be the first law, practically, that you would change? Um, it's difficult. <laughs> we are, yeah, we are fighting uh, against the discriminations and the uh, sexist apartheid because uh, uh, we have like a lot of segregation in uh, Muslim countries, mm -hmm. Muslim countries. Uh, um, I don't know about the law. We have to change the law and the mentality, actually, mm -hmm. both. Uh, in our movement, for example, because there is a lot of feminist organizations uh, and human rights organizations in Morocco, but there is like some issues and some sensitive subjects or uh, taboos, and we want to break taboos because... Can you name one? Like sexual and rep reproductive rights. Mm -hmm. So because in the law, in the Moroccan um, uh, code, uh, there is no... Uh, we cannot have sex before marriage. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, abort we don't have abortion rights. Mm -hmm. um, and there is like... Uh, we can... Women can abort only if uh, there is like a danger for her health, mm -hmm. but with the authorization of her husband. Mm -hmm. So it's complicated. So we are fighting for abortion rights. It's very important. And as we are, um, as we, uh, our method is civil disobedience. So we organize a lot of happenings to sense, uh, how to say it, to um, sensibilize. <laughs> Yeah. So, so, yeah. Thanks uh, about the, this issue, and uh, it's very important, I think, um, when we fight for secularism, or laicity, and against uh, uh, misogynistic law, misogynistic law, to fight um, for like uh, women to um, um, to do what they want uh, with her, with their bodies. Mm -hmm. So it's one of our fights. Like, uh, yeah. Thank you. Rana, if you would, if you would, could change any law, which one would go first? Universal law. Or no, <laughs> just one. You can change one. You can pick one. <laughs> it's complicated. I know. I will, I will remove Islam from the world. <laughs> yeah. And in it's and in detail, in in. Because I want to, I want to try and make it small because I don't think that people. Um, um, experience. You give me another example that um, if a woman doesn't want to have children anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is um, how to say it in English? Tubal uh, ligation, yeah? Yeah. So yeah, it's possible in Morocco, but it's not possible if the woman um, doesn't have uh, boys. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. And you know, we are talking about um, equality. Yeah, when, when uh, there is the, the baptism, so when a boy is born, is different uh, than when a, a girl is born. So during the baptism in uh, Islam, so there is a, a sh sheep, yeah, mm -hmm. sheep, sheep. <laughs> Yeah, sheep. <laughs> so when a boy is born, is two sheep, and when a girl is born, is one sheep. So, uh, yeah. Mm. So it's the it's uh, it's amazing. Mm. Rana, I want to ask you as well. Um, uh, so it's now four years since you moved, uh, of, of not moved, since you fled, um, and you've been writing a, a book about your experiences. Um, is your, is your, are people, are women in Saudi Arabia able to read your book, or is it forbidden? But until now, in German language, French and Czech Republic, um, I don't know if, if I want to translate it to Arabic, because I talk about uh, a lot of things. It will be dangerous if it will be in Arabic language. But now, after I get in touch with the women, they run away after they get in touch with my story. I feel like responsible to put my book in this language. Uh, for me, I don't have any hope from this country, uh, so I don't feel like really interesting to translate my book. Um, yeah. You don't feel any hope? From the politic, no. Uh, from the man, no. But from the women, yeah. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. You don't have to apologize for that at all. Um, and, and, how, and where do you find, where do you, where do you see the hope? What gives you hope? I see how we get bigger and bigger, the feminists I'm talking about, and the all Arabic country. I see how the women now changing, and I am happy to know that we are now really uh, notice that we need to fight for our rights. No one come to your home and knock the door and told you this is your right and this is your freedom. You have to fight. Yeah. 
Mm. I agree on that. Um, uh, are you hopeful? I have to, actually. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm fighting uh, for human rights, for freedom, and for women's rights, actually. So, yeah. You're yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to go in between to the hall to see if there's two questions. Yeah? Won't take it, so I'm coming towards you. I have one question from you. I know you from far and the campaign we ran to save you and have residency in any country. But the reality is in your book, you mentioned that you only had two choices, either to escape in order to keep your real identity or to kill yourself. So would you give these two choices to people who are living, the women who are living in Saudi Arabia, do you still give them do two choices, or do you give them a choice, only one choice to fight, nothing else? Thank you. And no one can understand the situation, only the people they live there, and they know the situation from inside. Some women, even if they're fighting for them right, even if they do everything, in the end, if they don't have any passport, any support, any help, it's completely obsolete place for, for me. It was like this. I was crying in my room, uh, he, he, asking for help. Uh, have the hope that come, someone come and help me. But it doesn't work like this. I, uh, now I feel I am more responsible to help the girl, this girl to have them right or to run away. What do you, what is, it's a bit of a, Tiring question, but I'm going to ask you anyway. We're sitting here and we're talking, uh, uh, and that's obviously a good thing, but what would be needed? Where? Well, for, for instance, from, from, from countries like the Netherlands, because we always trade with Saudi Arabia, our uh, uh, queen goes there. Sorry to not be, <laughs> to not give an answer that you're waiting for. No, we need the politic to start to believe in human rights and not about money or oil. Thank you. Is there one more question before we go to the next panel? One. Someone. Yes. <laughs> When you said about, you asked the question about a law you would like to change. Now I know about Tunisia that there, the women especially have fought for equality in the constitution in, instead of complementarity. How about Morocco? Is there the complementarity or is there the equality now? Okay. Um, first of all, uh, Morocco is an absolute monarchy of different rights. <laughs> And so the king is commander of uh, believers and is descendant of the prophet. So he's like a pop, actually. So yeah, there is a new constitution since 2011. And there is an article, article 19. And uh, the article, yeah, uh, uh, talk about the equality between men and women. All of things, like economical, social, etc. But the second part of the... Um, of the article, and uh, that's why I'm I'm angry uh, against the um, uh, feminist organizations in Morocco because uh, their uh, feminists are always talking about this article. But the second part of the ar article say that there is an equality in respect of the constants and the laws of the nations. So, what does it mean? So we cannot have equality in Morocco, actually, because the first constant is uh, Islam, and the laws uh, come from uh, the religion, so Islam. So it's very, very difficult. So it's very different, actually, from Tunisia. Um, can I both thank you very, very much for being here. Rana Ahmad and Betty. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm struggling with your last name. Lashga. Lashio. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. So for the second panel, I would like to invite uh,
Gita Sagal, she's a writer, a journalist, a filmmaker, a rights activist and for more than 40 years. Uh, currently, she is founder and director of the Center for Secular Space. And during the 1980s, she worked for a black current affairs program called Bandun File on Channel 4 TV. You've made two films about the Rushdie affair. You co-founded Southall Black Sisters and Women Against Fundamentalism. You're really a titan, if I can say that. Thank you very much. <laughs> for being here. Um, and we will join in conversation with Maike Meijer, uh, who worked as a teacher, literary journalist, activist, and professor of gender studies at University of Utrecht in Maastricht University. Uh, she published a great number of books uh, uh, and articles on Dutch literature and cultural theory, poetry, popular culture, feminism, gender theory, uh, much more. And currently, she's working on a study of shifting cultural representations of Masculinity, if I can say correctly. So Minika mentioned already, should it be women against gods um, uh, or gods against women? And I wanted to ask you, uh, do, do you think gods can have women's interests? Well, um, oh, sorry, I have to I go. Was, uh, Thank you. This one, that's okay. I've never... Uh, had much to do with gods or goddesses um, because I come from a free thinking family, mm -hmm. but my uh, religious, the religious tradition of my family was Hinduism, of course, which is full of goddesses and uh, quite powerful ones, but it doesn't seem to make the position of women in society any better. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there are a whole lot of extremely hyper-masculine and sexist men who worship goddesses and continue to be extremely sexist in real life. So mm -hmm. although the idea of goddesses can be an important source of myth and uh, story and um, examples, and certainly Indian feminists have, um, you know, there was a feminist press called Kali Press mm -hmm. after uh, a goddess was uh, uh, outrageous in many ways because she's very violent. She's uh, also black, Kali means black. Uh, and so on. So they've used those ideas, but actually mostly people have been struggling to get away from the idea of, of being embedded in religion. Maike? What was the question again? I want I'm to sorry. ask you if, there's, if there are, uh, I, maybe I can ask it in a different way. Because I was wondering, do you reckon that the abolishment of religion would be a solution for inequality? Should we leave religion altogether to get equal? Is that a solution? Uh, no. Why not? Um, no. Uh, um, um, I believe that, that there is something in religion. It has a utopian heart, religion. But religion is massively misused by uh, patriarchy. Uh, let's say I, uh, I was raised as a Catholic girl, and I remember this very well in the 50s in the Netherlands. And, and it is very often when I, when I hear my Muslim sister speak that I look into the mirror because Everything that Muslim girls um, uh, uh, experience, uh, the hate against the female body. You have to cover yourself. You have to be modest. You do not, um, you are not allowed to speak. Um, uh, talk about sexuality is an impossible thing. You have to listen to the men in the family. Uh, do not go out too much. Uh, and all, all things like that, uh, we, we have been there in the Netherlands. It's not very long ago. It's, it's 60 years ago. So, uh, but the question is whether this has something to do with religion. Is, it is legitimized by religion. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's in the Bible uh, and so on. But, but um, I think that, uh, as Gustav Jung said, if you abolish religion, something comes in place that is probably much worse. Uh, religion is already <laughs> quite awful, but 
uh, there are a lot of religious concepts and ideas saying uh, paradise, the, uh, the perfect world. Um, uh, 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 it's in, 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 in Marxism as well. All kinds of ideas that uh, we have sinned, uh, we should improve ourselves, we should strive for perfection. So if it's not in the religious system, it's somewhere else. And I think it's very important to unravel that. What do you think? Well, the, the reason I'm hesitating is because, uh, because I grew up um, where atheism was not a struggle for me, as, as it has been for so many people in, in, in the room. Um, and uh, I've actually had to learn from my friends who've grown up in conservative and fundamentalist religious environments, uh, and I learn from my ex-Muslim friends every day, uh, that religion is not just a metaphor. You know, it is very material, and the idea of paradise on the one hand and hell on the other is such a material reality that it creates terror in small children. So, you know, there, there are some atheists who've never had to struggle who think that religion can be okay because it's simply metaphoric, and actually it isn't, it's about uh, as we all agree, it's about religious, rigid rules and practices. That, but I agree with you that it's not, that isn't the sum total of it. And I don't believe in abolition because that's, that is authoritarian and totalitarian as well. And if we're struggling against one form of totalitarian, we don't want to um, replace it with another. And that's why most of my own work has concentrated on religious fundamentalism, which is the movements, the political movements around religion, uh, which are really far right uh, and fascist movements. And I think they exist in all religions, including some people think that they only come from the Abrahamic religions. But I'm sitting here telling you that we have a far right fascist government. And I use the word, uh, I, I'm not just throwing the word around as an insult. Um, the, the movement that is in power in India today was born around the same time as Hitler and Mussolini, drew inspiration from them. Uh, they have made Mein Kampf a very popular book sold in, on railway stations and markets in India. Um, and the idea of abolishing peoples who do not conform is absolutely embedded in it. And that can mean atheists and rationalists who have been subjected to um, uh, uh, assassination, uh, but it can also mean uh, people who do not conform on the basis of their religious identity, so Muslims and Christians who are deemed to be following a religion that is outside the soil of India, because it's a, it's a blood and soil, far-right, fascist, nationalist movement, which is in power today. Um, so, I, uh, unfortunately, I can't abolish it. I mean, I have no power to. But I wouldn't want to try. We want to defeat it. We want to defeat its ideas. We want to defeat the way in which its ideas have become embedded in quite ordinary, normal people who would not have been hostile to people of other religions even a few years ago, and now have swallowed the propaganda and hate their neighbors. You know, Hindus hate Muslims to the extent that they feel they should be murdered, and so that ordinary people will go and murder their neighbors. I mean, the, 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 the intolerance and the extreme promotion of violence is so great. I, I, I really cannot <laughs> underestimate it. You know, Saif uh, Al Maluk, the Pakistani lawyer who spoke to us, gave us a, an address today, and he mentioned Kashmiris in India. They have been under lockdown. An entire state is under lockdown. Um, with, with uh, very little news and information coming out about what's going on, but what news is coming out is extremely frightening, simply for being who they are, for being Kashmiri, uh, the state which the government is saying is integrating into India to become full citizens of India, that's the rhetoric, that they're becoming like the rest of us, 
have actually been put under lock and key. Uh, all their elected democratic leaders have been locked up. I mean, this is like a counter jihad, which is like, a, it's, it's a jihad, really. It's a religious Hindu jihad in India, uh, which is mirroring the jihad that has been coming from Pakistan for many, many years. It is a very frightening situation. So, I, but I don't talk about abolition in that way because I think we are people of ideas and we are people who essentially work on the basis of the dignity of all human beings and human life. And in that, I don't promote another form of intolerance in the name of atheism. Um, but but may, I, may I ask, um, uh, um, uh, do you not believe that in India then a religion is used as, as, as the instrument to divide groups? Like in the, in the Balkan wars, being a, a, a Croat or a Serb, so ethnic arguments were used to divide uh, groups of people against each other. In, um, uh, in um, Rwanda, the Hutus and the Tutsis were created uh, in order to divide groups of people. And it was said, especially the Hutus who have intermarried, intermarried with the Tutsis. They are the, the traitors. So, I mean, um, there are always arguments, whether it's religious arguments or race arguments or ethnic arguments, in order to divide groups of people. Well, that, that doesn't help to stop it. Uh, I totally agree. No, I think, I think we're agreeing there, but I think you've raised an important point that I feel that uh, places that have had genocides enacted, they, uh, I think that genocide is in many ways a, a massive crime of intimacy. It is about creating people as the other in order to divide. It is using ideologies, often of religion, sometimes of other things like ethnicity and so on, in order to create people who are your neighbors, who may be your lover, who may be your husband or wife, and treat them suddenly as if they have become outside yourself. Yeah, yeah. And it's the ideology that is used to do that where people have intermarried. Because I think often, and in the cases you mentioned, these, these are communities that had firmly intermarried each other yeah. for generations. Yeah. That's not quite so true in India, but it is true that people lived together. They celebrated each other's festivals. They, they um, it, not every aspect of religion has always been divisive. And certainly, yeah. if you're released from the theology of religion, which I was, it's not that we didn't do things, you know, on Diwali we had fireworks, on Holi, which is a spring festival, you get dressed up in your old clothes and you throw color on each other. And uh, at Christmas, we eat lots and lots and sing songs and carols. And I mean, we, you do all the nice things to do with religion. And in fact, people who are religious do it with their neighbors, you know. Yeah. And, and I think this happened all over Africa, all over Asia. But it is those, when those ideologies come into play, and that's where we work on religious fundamentalism, that it, they become sharpened so that those quite ordinary, normal interactions, uh, which are uh, sometimes loving, certainly uh, polite, uh, which are also very culturally intertwined. Um, people, people here probably have heard of Sufis, you know, the, the sort of ecstatic forms of uh, Islam and, so, and in song yeah. and uh, dance and so on. There are similar movements in Hinduism, they're called bhakti. Um, and they, in, they, they mix each other up. I mean, people who practice these religions don't necessarily make a differentiation between Islam and Hinduism in the way it's practiced. So for me, uh, the, the, the destruction that's going on is not us wanting to destroy religion, but the destruction of the ordinary, everyday practices uh, of um, either of worship, people attending the same shrines, or uh, for, which is more, what is more valuable for me, the cultural practices, the song, song dance, poetry, performance, music, where uh, the, the, the traditions have come from all the different religious traditions. So you have Muslim musicians singing about the god Krishna, you have Hindu musicians singing about Allah and so on. And they have, uh, you know, their gurus and their masters, you know, they may be 
somebody from one religious background from mm -hmm. practicing in another. Uh, but you can only do that, you, you could do it in two different ways. One is in a country where, or in a, a societies where it's been practiced like that for ages, and where the law is not driving people apart, and others where the society has become secularized, uh, and where the, the, these traditional practices have moved with the secularization to be um, dignified as cultural practices. They're not as seen only as, as religious. So in, in India, it's, it's actually the left, uh, the communists, the progressives, the liberals, who keep alive the musical traditions and so Often. on, yeah. and who invite people from each other's countries. We try, in, even in, when the countries are at war, Pakistan and India, they will try and invite musicians and other people mm -hmm. in order to create that, keep that human contact alive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I want to ask something else, because there was something, um, also going back a bit more to the, to the topic, you said that the gender equality is at the heart of the Hindu right uh, uh, agenda at this moment when we talk about the yes. rise of Hindu I nationalism. I should have said inequality probably. Yes, yes sorry, yes, yes. you did, yes, the gender inequality yeah. is, at, is at the heart. Yeah. Um, but do you, do you think the rise of it, of the Hindu nationalism, is it a reaction to, to more equality? Or do you, so how is the inequality at the heart? I, I think uh, these movements are always very nervous about the liberation of women. And uh, it's, a it's a reaction to many things. Uh, among them, uh, I, I mean, as I said, that the, the, this Hindu right movement was born actually by an atheist. The man who invented the term Hindutva was himself an atheist. He wanted, to, he precisely wanted to, uh, you know, use a masculinized and militarized and fascist version of Hinduism, which he partly invented, but he himself had no religious feelings at all, so it was nothing to do with his uh, spirituality. This, this is an exact it's demonstration a, of how religion is misused uh, in order to, to, to create divisions. Except that I don't think there's an essence of pure religion that, for me, it's not necessarily that great. I mean, the caste system is absolutely, inequality is embedded in the heart of Hinduism. And in all religions that are born in the Indian subcontinent, I mean, they, they, it cannot be escaped. Um, the Asya Bibi case is at least partly, and I think it's not noticed, is about the, the practice of untouchability. It's about making people so other that you will not drink water from their hand. You know, so uh, it's, it's seen, uh, uh, I mean, it is about blasphemy, uh, because that's what she was charged with, but she was reviled and despised as a Christian family in this that was not seen as fully human. And the issue of water, I mean, any Hindu can recognize this, anybody from a Hindu background, this is about untouchability as well as about blasphemy. It's about a toxic combination of the two things. So uh, when, to go back to gender inequality, I mean, the Hindu right is a little odd in some ways because of the advances that women have made in India. They have many women who are very active. I mean, they're ardent fascists. Uh, so some of the, uh, them are dressed in orange robes as, as kind of women priests. Um, who, who are some of their biggest cheerleaders, but they also have a female defense minister, they have foreign minister who's a woman. Women are very visible in the Hindu, in the Hindu right cabinet in a way that they're not in many other countries. But the idea that people should intermarry is absolutely anathema to them. So they have uh, created cells of people in the civil courts because India has a, an incomplete secularism, but the national movement was a movement for secularism as much as it, as it was one for overthrowing empire. It was both things at the same time. And there were women who were very much part of that, who actually helped to uh, foundationally you know, build the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is why I get very angry when people say that uh, uh, human rights is a Western concept. Uh, one, it doesn't matter. I think ideas are not patented. It doesn't really matter where they came from, but actually it's not true because it's, it is women from all over the world who, who uh, contributed to the Universal Declaration, including Indian women. Um, so they want to undo all of those things. They want to undo the fact that in the Constitution of India, the scientific temper is named as a good, probably the first constitution that actually names that. They want to undo, un, undo the sense of science 
advancing and progressing and helping people's lives. And they want to undo the idea that women particularly, but anybody can marry who they want. So they take the traditional forms that have been happening of so-called honor killings, which are really about maintaining caste distinctions, and turn them into a political project to stop intermarriage through civil law. Mm -hmm. Because in, in, in the courts, there's, a spe there's an act called the Special Marriages Act, in which couples from uh, different religious backgrounds can marry through the civil law. Um, but they have to announce it. They have to put uh, their names before the court for a certain number of weeks. So these people monitor the courts and threaten the couples and go to their families and try and persuade them not to marry. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they can't do that, then they, you know, they may actually attack the couple. Uh, they may kill one or both. We, we, uh, we're more advanced in India than other countries, so often the man is killed as well as the woman in other countries. The, just the woman might be killed. Uh, in an honor crime. That is a, that is a narrative that we have yeah. here as well, I think. Maybe it, it doesn't go, I think, no, sometimes it does go to that extreme. But, but, but um, one of the things that is said often when there's refugees coming into the Netherlands is they're going to steal our women. Uh, do you recognize this? this? Do you think that this is happening here? Unfortunately, I do. But it, oh, uh, uh, yes, I recognize it, but uh, it's too awful. It's it's uh, as if women belong to somebody else, except except to themselves. Yeah, it's a it's always there in the right uh, about the women. Uh, you know, the, the the safety of the women being at the heart of it. So on the one hand, there's a promotion of rape and violence against women in the family, and of the women of the other. But there's also that fear that our women are being stolen. Mm -hmm. And now in India, one of, the, one of the more disgusting aspects of what's happening around Kashmir is that people are saying, uh, now we can marry Kashmiri women, mm -hmm. right? Now the point is that no, no Kashmiri woman was ever stopped from marrying anybody she wanted to marry if, you know, of choice uh, if she chose to marry somebody who was a foreigner or from some other part of India. But now there's this idea that we own Kashmir, India owns Kashmir, and we are owning the women of Kashmir. I mean, it is a rape narrative. And it comes uh, particularly because India's ratio of men to women in the population is particularly bad. And there's some states where there are really very few women because women are killed at birth. They're not born uh, because uh, people prefer to have sons, so they abort uh, women. Uh, these, the levels of infanticide of women or the, just the deaths of women, uh, children, <laughs> girls yeah. are higher than boys and so on and so on. So you have a gap between the numbers of men and the numbers of women. And there are actually songs being produced, there are ministers making statements saying, oh, now we can, you know, we have Kashmir so we can marry these women and address these gaps in, really in our society. So it's really about a public discussion from the highest levels of government about the enslaving of women. It's awful. I, I, uh, when I thought about our discussion, I was thinking about um, does monotheistic religions versus polytheistic religions make any difference? No. And now I think, no, <laughs> no. no, let's not talk about it. I mean, it's already answered. And religions um, without God don't make any difference either. Buddhism started as a religion without God, and it has its right-wing components yes. as well, as we see in Burma uh, yeah. over the Rohingya yeah. case yeah. in Sri Lanka, uh, you know, with the civil war in Sri Lanka and a massive majoritarian Buddhist uh, uh, feeling. So, I, you know, no religion is exempt. And that's why yeah. I, I struggle with this idea that there's a pure essence of religion that's good. I, I really do. Uh, uh, I, I don't mean that all religious people can't be good and that there aren't good things in it. But I think religion is what religion does. It's a set of practices. And yes, it has produced beautiful music, great architecture, a, a lot of art and creation has been done in the name of religion, which is marvelous, and I think is part of uh, the heritage of humankind. But I just struggle. The, the, the reason I'm saying this is because there's become um, an idea which the ex-Muslim movement is really a fundamental challenge to, 
that when the world woke up to the security th threat of Muslim fundamentalism, um, because the other fundamentalism was not considered a security threat in the same way, even if they're massacring lots and lots of people. But when, uh, particularly the Western world, but other parts of the world woke up to this very real threat, the answer by governments, including Western governments, certainly the British government where, where I live, was that we need a better Islam and we must create this Islam. And, uh, and, and there was a lot of talk about an enlightenment, we must create an enlightenment and so on, which was, I think, a, not historically based because actually, you know, it, it doesn't happen out of theological discussion. If Muslims become more moderate, in many countries I believe they have, they fought for changes in laws, women have fought as Muslim women for, for changing the laws that we were discussing in the previous panel, uh, guardianship laws and things like that, and they have not necessarily left Islam to do that. But they've done it in an atmosphere which was secularizing, where they could make those arguments. Okay. You know, that was yeah. the point. Now, uh, what I meant is that uh, in, in all religions that I know are um, mystics, who, uh, experience, who, who talk about experience of the divine or revelations um, being connected to something that's bigger than just a human. And there, there are um, fundamental questions in life like, why do we die? Uh, what's the meaning of life? And, and you know, reflections about that are very uh, universal. And, and um, yeah, it, it has taken the form of religion, uh, but there's something universal in it. Um, uh, and, and yeah, uh, I, I don't think that we do have to throw that away. Um, that was no, my but, uh, Yes, no, I, I, I'm, I, I'm just, I'm not so much disagreeing as qualifying some of the things from my own experience that um, you know, the mystical tradition I've always felt was a very attractive tradition because it was yeah. one that challenged rules, it challenged authoritarianism, it challenged mindless ritual, and some of the greatest poetry ever written has come precisely from those challenges. And I, I mean, I named one of my sons after a 15th century mystical poet precisely wow. because he did that. <laughs> uh, you know, the challenged ritual, uh, uh, the building of temples and mosques and so on. But what I see is that no tradition is exempt from being used by fundamentalists or by people in violent ways. So in India, the idea of Ram, uh, who is a god, you know, great epic, the Ramayana written about him, um, has been used in a very violent political campaigns about building a particular temple, which people say is on the birthplace of Ram, although you know he's a mythological character, we don't. If he was, if there was a historical Ram who was, you know, a warlord in whichever century, we don't really know where he was born and so on. But they insist that historically he was born in this particular place, and that that mosque that was built there has to be destroyed. So that's one use where the myth has been turned, which, which for most Indians is a very, you know, the. The greeting Ram Ram is like a peace greeting, you know, that villagers use with each other. Mm. And the Hindutva people say Jai Shri Ram, which means victory to Ram. So a, quite a peaceful greeting, which is like saying, I don't know, Shalom or Salam or anything else, has been turned into a very militant uh, yeah. way of, of looking at it. Yeah. But, so, but uh, we, uh, we have listened to uh, Minike Schipper talking about um, female gods and, and matriarchy, yeah? Wouldn't, wouldn't have, uh, is it not a crucial moment that, that uh, the, the mother goddess was replaced by male gods, um, by uh, uh, monotheism, with a totally different conception of t time, na namely linear time? You go from the origin to the end, to the, to the solution of the whole uh, world plan and so on, heaven, um, uh, the victory of Christ and, and what have you. But in, uh, in, in more matriarchal cultures, the people had a circular view of time. Uh, 
it was all about continuity and the task of human beings was to preserve the continuity. Um, yeah, okay, we, we have lost that whole world view. We have lost uh, uh, the female <laughs> gods. The female principle. Well, yeah. we haven't in India, that's my point. I mean, they're, they're alive and well, I promise you. Oh, the yeah? female gods are everywhere, and mm. some of these fascists are worshipping them and, and going out help. and doing their killing. I want to. Uh, so, and, you know, okay. and, and, and also the mystical tradition, I do want to go back to that, because we cannot understand the Rushdie affair, we cannot understand the hysteria in Pakistan about blasphemy laws. Uh, and, and, and which we, we, we've heard about at various times today, that thousands, hundreds of thousands of people came out on the streets to demand the killing of one very poor woman who had been in prison for nine, ten years. I mean, why? Why? And why is it? Why is it? Because these people don't come from the Salafi tradition, many of the ones on the streets. They don't come from what one thinks of as the fundamentalist tradition. They come precisely from the mystic tradition. Those were the people who were mobilized in Britain and other places, the Muslims who were mobilized, were the ones who the fundamentalist tradition that doesn't care so much about the person of the prophet, mobilized precisely who are known in the West as Sufis, other groups of people for whom the, pro the, the idea of the prophet was a sacred one very, very sacred to their tradition. And the love of the prophet expressed through this wonderful song and poetry was turned into the demands for the calls for Rushdie's hanging and for the banning of the satanic verses. So what I'm trying to say is no tradition, however wonderful it is in some of its aspects, cannot be turned around. So when we're talking okay. about instrumentalization, all these traditions have been turned around and used to promote murder. I think we could talk about this uh, for another two hours, but yes. um, um, I have to go and, and look at, because I think there's questions, um, and I'm going to collect them. Yeah. Actually, uh, what I realize um, in India, they have secularism, but it's halfway, not even halfway, one fourth of the way of secularism, because it allows the religion, every religion, to practice their own law and, and, and regulations. So there are 400 derivatives of different kinds of religion in India, and all 400, they have right to practice their own law and regulation. So I think the main thing you have to fight for real secularism in, in India, but also class issue too. I mean, it's impossible to understand all these class issues. And, and it comes out of uh, the public education is very low. I can see that there are lots of activists in India, but we need to join each other and do much more public education. Otherwise, how could a one single sect of uh, India manage to bring that many people out to shout to murder one person, and, and that person was totally innocent. So to me, public education. That was yeah, Pakistan. Not that was in Pakistan. But in India too, we have these kind of class issues that we need to somehow challenge it and join together to challenge it. And I don't see this join, join uh, um, you know, mobi mobilizing this joint quality together or uh, co, you know, to co, to co, um, yeah, to <laughs> to coordinate it together. I don't see that, and that. Do you want to react? Uh, yeah. Um, well, actually, historically, the the women's movements in South Asia have been very coordinated. So they've stood aside from the war. You know, they've never taken nationalist positions on the wars that have been fought between the countries. Um, they've, they've supported each other, they've condemned militarism and fundamentalism, they've been doing it for uh, uh, at least a generation, you know. Um, but you're right that many of the other networks, there were networks, I mean, unfortunately we are missing Marie Aimé Eli Lucas, uh, she wasn't able to come, she would have spoken on the, uh, the previous panel. She really is a very great person that we should honor, at least in 
uh, remembering her and wishing her well and back to health because she, she had an injury and she couldn't travel, uh, because she founded Women Living Under Muslim Laws. And that was a, a group of women who were both uh, uh, irreligious. I, I don't like using the term secular for meaning irreligious, because I think it means separation. And there could be secular people who are both religious and irreligious. But women who are totally irreligious or atheist and women who are still Muslim believers in a single group across the, you know, with groups across the world. Um, and they did a lot of research and they ran a lot of campaigns and that just isn't happening, certainly with that particular grouping anymore. And so we, I, I think the ex-Muslim groupings, which is an internationalist grouping is, you know, running campaigns and doing work, strategic work around these things. And at least in London, I mean, I'm not an ex-Muslim. As I said, I don't come from a Muslim background. Uh, and I've always been an atheist. So we have our links with, you know, my friend Yasmin, who's just arrived, who uh, is a secular Muslim, with people who are, you know, non-believers from other faiths and traditions. And we, we're linking up precisely to work on issues of parallel legal systems and, uh, you know, to argue about it in England, but making the international links around some of those. But we do need much, much more of that kind of work. You're absolutely right. Um, and next question, I have two over here. Can you please uh, try to keep them short? Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, Gita, you were saying that um, you are against abolishing religion and we have to defeat religions. And um, I absolutely agree with that. However, I'm wondering a lot about the ways we can defeat religion. What are those ways? And so there is something that particularly has been bothering me uh, for, the, for some time recently, is this attempts of some religious women, and I want to emphasize women, to, um, to reform, as they say, religion, but to reform it not in a way, to, you know, to kind of in the soft way as we know it too, but really go against um, what this religion is really about. So to say, to become, uh, to take positions, you know, in, in um, positions of authority in religious institutions, to completely um, uh, reread texts, and not by saying, oh, the text was mis misinterpreted and it's a wrong interpretation, but actually saying it was written in that medieval time, those are medieval ideas, today we're living in the 21st century and this religion has to catch up. So, on, on the one hand, I'm very skeptical about these efforts. Yet, I also understand that everything they try to do, indeed they try to destroy, to defeat those religions that we are fighting, without going out, without saying, I'm an atheist. So I would like to know, what do you think about this way of defeating religion? Is this something we have to support, consider, or maybe even join? Thank you. Well, may I start to answer this? Um, I believe that there are many ways to roam, to use a uh, Catholic expression. Um, uh, I, I, I think that in the Netherlands, are, uh, particularly, there are many f f feminist theologians who do exactly that. They reread and reinterpret the Bible, and they say, um, it was not man who was created in the shape of God because the Bible says he created man and woman in his shape and so on. So, and, uh, and I believe that that is very important if you want to do this, to, to reconstruct uh, and fight for the position of women within religions. I, I think it's important, yet uh, yet, I also think that there is an ongoing process of, of secularization, at least in, in Western Europe. I, I don't know how that's going in India, but... It's going backwards. Yeah, going backwards yeah and, and even in the Netherlands, we had a very strong Bible belt, which goes from Zealand over, uh, Zealand over the Veluwe to Drenthe, but it's it's steadily diminishing. It, it's not so important anymore. It's only a very, very small community nowadays. Um, so yeah, maybe religion it, it, it evaporates, 
but it comes back in the form of instrumentalized religion. Yeah. I think that's it. I think, um, you know, I've changed my views about it because I've seen what's been happening. Because there was a, t I mean, some of my closest friends were people who were involved with some of these movements. And in fact, women living under Muslim laws when they first formed, the religious women among them uh, did look at the Quran for various examples and things like this. They had Quran reading sessions and so on. But they also did a lot of work looking at, uh, for women, sort of uh, comparative, um, uh, you know, looking at customary law, Islamic law, and uh, civil law, the legal, you know, the civil codes, to see which were more protective, you know, in cases of custody and practical issues. Because they were facing such a huge backlash, they were trying to create arguments that any woman could use, and they helped each other with court cases and things by using examples to help women facing blasphemy charges or, uh, you know, uh, trying to gain custody of their children and so on. So, you know, does some other country have a better law? Either is the Islamic law better? That was actually their way of deconstructing Islamic law as well, because they showed that it's, it's, it's not monolithic. But what's happened with that, and really partly because it's really been pushed by governments, but also by some of the feminist theologians themselves, so-called feminist, I don't think they're very feminist, um, uh, I think that's a different, this is, uh, with, with Islam, it's a different process than what happened with Christianity because there wasn't this official push. You know, the, femi the feminist theologians within Christianity were fighting their church. They were fighting the church hierarchy. So I would always feel sympathetic to that because I say it's not my struggle, but yes, let them have women priests. Let them fight for women priests or whatever yeah. the key yeah. fights were, yeah. e equal marriage, et cetera, et cetera. I feel it's not my struggle, but it is a struggle. But what's happened with the, uh, w w with Islam and, and, and this so-called feminism is that it actually sees ex-Muslims and secular Muslims as their worst enemy. And, yeah. and Jimmy, you helped me understand how also. I mean, I've learned so much from all of you, many of you sitting here in this room because, because you know, it seemed obvious to us that actually we're on the same side. If you're criticizing religion, we're criticizing religion. You know, we're on the same side. But, it's very hard to criticize the jamaat -e islami who are mass murderers and will go and threaten you in your homes and know where you live and stuff like that. You know, uh, they're a major respectable fundamentalist group that, you know, looking for government in Bangladesh and Pakistan and places like that. Uh, so much easier to stand with them and talk about Islamophobia and call us Islamophobes as, as if we were the murderers and, and uh, you know, denounce us. I mean, you know, so several of us have been denounced, Mariam and me, for example, in an a organization which is called I Inclusive Mosque, which is about having equal ceremonies, you know, uh, what could be wrong with that? Prayers, equal prayers, women leading prayers, uh, non-sectarian, uh, sympathetic to uh, LGBT people, uh, disabled people, etc., uh, having these um, Muslim worship in an egalitarian way. How could we object? But what do they do? When Mariam organizes a conference on secularism, they organize a conference on anti-secularism, how secularism is this huge danger, when the only way they can survive is in a secular context. <laughs> I want to go to the... And they denounce both of us. And that's the truth of what's going on. So it's become a toxic movement. I want to ask, uh, go to the next question. So, uh, uh, in, in your discussion, you dis you, one of you said um, religion is misused um, to separate people or to, um, for misogyny. I was wondering, if we, if, we, if we are using the word misuse, it means that it's useful in some way. So, can you provide an example where religion was useful for women's rights? That's my question. Well, well, uh, the whole issue is, is religion useful or not? It, it's there. Uh, it, uh, it's um, uh, it's a, a, a reality. And, and if we think it's not useful, it, it's not going to go away. But, um, but yes, I, I believe that it's misused. Um, yeah, when, when I hear you talking about what's happening in India, uh, uh, that there is a fascist regime um, which is deeply embedded in Hinduism, yeah, I think it's, it's grossly misused. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, my mother is a campaigner against Hindutva, and uh, she would say that as a Hindu, she doesn't believe in that form of Hinduism. But I say I'm not a Hindu, and I, you know, I think it's inherent. I don't think all Hindus are like that, but I think it is, I, I, I don't use the misuse argument. I do believe, like you, that it's instrumentalized, but I think that the misuse is also embedded. I mean, the way it's used badly is embedded in religion. I want to ask a last uh, uh, question before we're rounding up. Um, and Ina Shevchenko, Shevchenko, I have to say, said yesterday that this is um, uh, all the rise of these nationalist conservative male groups, you can see it as a backlash to emancipation. Um, and I was wondering if you keep that in mind, are you hopeful or are you, are you thinking this backlash is going to be such a big backlash that it's, it's, it's doing a, 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 it's going to make it a lot worse before um, it gets better. Yeah, um, uh, we have a sociologist, he's called Bram de Swan, maybe you know him. He just wrote a book against women. And he argues it's that, joke. that <laughs> there's a huge uh, backlash going on right now against feminist movement, and he sees all the the, the, the neo-fascist right-wing governments, uh, uh, movements, um, um, radicalism uh, by, by men. He sees that as a backlash against f feminism. And he, he argues that in the heart of many right-wing new political movements is a male agenda against uh, freedom of women, against abortion, against, um, yeah, that, that women uh, f form an equal part of the world. So he sees that as a kind of, uh, he sees right-wing political movements as a backlash against feminism. And that says something about the success of feminism and the appeal of feminism, which is experienced as the danger of feminism. And that's why the, the, the backlash is so strong. So in a way, um, that's hopeful. <laughs> so we, we have to go on uh, working, mm -hmm. uh, I think. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think it is the danger of women's fight for freedom, which is which is one of the hearts of these, but but other other fights for freedom as well against caste, against various forms of inequality. Uh, there are huge movements rising everywhere, uh, but in it, 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 I'm not an optimistic person. I mean, in in English terms, if anybody's ever heard of Winnie the Pooh, you know, I'm like the character called Eeyore. You know, there's a very <laughs> depressed donkey. That pretty much is my view of the world generally. Um, but, but so, so I think it's, I agree, I think, I think it's the movements that are causing it, but what nobody could have predicted, because it's precisely what makes me angry about this whole sort of Islamic reform, is not that I don't want Islam to reform, or I, I actually think it's unhistorical because it posits Islam as never having reformed, and actually there have been numerous reform movements and changes in law and so on, precisely because people fought. Um, and, and, and that did change uh, uh, societies and social structures and, and the freedoms of women within those societies. So it hasn't been static. But this, but this idea that, um, that reform will happen, nobody factored in that if you have fundamentalism, the reaction to it is that people leave religion. The ayatollahs in Iran mean that young Iranians are leaving religion. You know, Saudis, as we heard from Rana, are leaving religion. All across the world, people are leaving religion yeah. because they cannot stomach the way it has become. It, the, the friends of mine who have remained Muslims are friends who did not grow up in that, that kind of extreme fundamentalism. So they could retain whatever idea they had of the spirituality of religion because they didn't have to live by the law. You know, so it, it, there, there is a reaction which was nobody predicted and it's happening. And the, the Bali, I have to be, I'm very grateful to you for having this because in England we cannot find a venue. 
It is really difficult. I know how much Mariam has struggled all these years to hold the conferences and to be here and be greeted by the mayor uh, and as, uh, as heretics and rebels and infidels and so on. There is not one mayor of any British city that would have said what was said here today in Amsterdam. And I'm very grateful to you all. Thank you both very, very much for being here. Mike Meijer and Kitta Sigal. Um, um, uh, and also, of course, uh, uh, Betty Lashar, uh, uh, Rana Ahmad, uh, Minneke Schipper, and Atusha. Um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm struggling. Paramount. <laughs> Thank you all uh, for being here. And um, uh, hopefully, I see you uh, uh, in another program tomorrow with us. Um, because tomorrow we have another full day of programs, uh, the whole day. And I think now it's really time for a drink. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>